Good afternoon, everyone. This is the fourth in the series of five SIG Automotive Sambath talks. And today we have a, a very interesting speaker, Professor Suresh Nagesh from Pesit University. And uh, uh, the speaker will be introduced to us by our session chair of today, which is uh, Professor Roland Haas. So, Roland, please take over. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Sujit. Um, welcome again to this, I guess, very interesting talk we will hear today. Um, I would like to um, give a brief um, background on Professor Sujit, uh, Professor uh, Suresh Nagish. Um, let me just uh, start. Dr. Suresh holds a PhD in computational mechanics from Drexel University in Philadelphia, USA. For his PhD, Dr. Suresh worked under the guidance of renowned professor Albert S. D. Wang on a NASA-sponsored ADCAS Advanced Technology Composite Aircraft Structures Program. From India, Dr. Suresh is an IIT Kanpur alumni. He graduated, graduated with a master's in solid mechanics in 1987. Currently working as a senior vice president and CTO for Quantum Point Private Limited, and also as a passage chair professor in computational mechanics at PESU, one of the premier technical institutes of the state. Dr. Suresh's main responsibility includes setting up and developing the Quantum Technology Center to cater to the needs of aerospace, automotive, and advanced engineering. Quantum Point and its principals with decades of experience will be and are involved from material through the product with the engineering process from designing, prototyping and testing. Prior to Quantum Point, Dr. Shuresh was a chair professor at PSU. Before that, he was also the managing director of Boyd Engineering Services India which is a division of White Germany. Dr. Suresh was responsible for developing the center from scratch, the center support activities of Airbus worldwide, several automotive customers, and some Indian high-end engineering companies. Dr. Suresh was also responsible to develop long-term relationships with Airbus India. Dr. Suresh headed key advanced engineering groups at Daimler Chrysler Research and Technology India, at GE Global Research and Development, the so called Jack Welch Technology Center in Bangalore. And prior to that, he spent a long time in the US. He worked with Ford and Daimler Chrysler RD in the US. He has many publications in journals and conferences has been a keynote speaker in various international conferences and holds nine US patents, in addition to guiding masters and PhD students in his current role. So today's talk about digital twin touches upon a very important area, cyber physical systems, and we will get an overview of the current application domain <laughs> as well as some theoretical background on these digital twins, how they applied, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges. Just a few words on my relationship with Dr. Suresh. We know each other for much more than 20 years. Actually, when I came to India, I was asked to head the R&D center of Mercedes-Benz Daimler. And I was looking out for uh, some people who could build up the engineering domain, and we came together and Suresh was working at uh, Jack Welch Center at that time and found out about our background going back to, to Daimler, Daimler Chrysler. And since then we have been in close touch all in his various roles. And of course, also now in the academic role where he's a professor as the PESIT and I'm working at ITB. 
So without much further ado, I would like to hand it over to Professor Dr. Suresh to talk about digital twins, opportunities and challenges. Dr. Suresh, it's your stage. Uh, Dr. Ronan, thank you so very much. And uh, I also thank uh, IIITB for providing me this opportunity. Thank you also very much for this somewhat talk. Uh, essentially, this is a continuation of what we started as a talk last time. And I will continue with that and I will take you through some of the new areas of digital print technologies that uh, we are getting into. In fact, these are some of the projects that are funded by Mercedes and some by CMTI, uh, you know, which is a central manufacturing technology institute from Bangalore. So first of all, uh, let's just do a small recap of what we talked last time. So the digital twin in engineering conventionally differs from the digital twin in IT. We did talk quite a bit about it. Our main problem in engineering is that we don't have infinite set of data because we can only you know, provide finite number of sensors on any systems or subsystem of our interest. Typically, digital twin in engineering started way back, uh, you know, two to three decades ago, when a lot of finite element applications, you know, started getting into the automotive and aerospace industry. Of course, now it is spread across all engineering domains. Those days, we used to call it as virtual prototyping, or actually trying to analyze systems and subsystems using numerical methods. And today, with the uh, integration of hardware and software, meaning integrating directly the in-situ data coming from sensors with the numerical simulation. One can actually develop physical digital twins, which are capable of decision making. So today, the digital twin in engineering is more an integrated structural health monitoring system. Uh, of course, we have now seen that the same knowledge can be applied to many other uh, applications in engineering. I'll talk a little bit about them. But fundamentally, it starts with, on one end, the numerical simulation of complex physics. Uh, some of us have been doing this for years. I started when I was at sixth semester at IIT Kanpur on CAE. And today, also, one of my core strengths is still CAE. A lot of uh, numerical simulations of complex physics problems. And then I have on the other side the advantage today of acquiring data from actual systems or devices through sensors. And the digital twin work that we started was about six years back with Siemens. And we developed the first ever physical digital twin for Siemens, which we made completely wireless connected to the cloud. And today it is getting on Siemens motors, making the Siemens motors smart. That knowledge, now we are actually using it for a variety of other applications, which I'll talk to you today. So in essence here, what we did was, on one hand, we could create a lot of defects in the finite element models in terms of physics and get a lot of failure data. And from the actual sensors on real systems, we were able to get the in-situ data, compare that, look at the actual responses and take decisions based on the response. And we went to the extent where we integrated machine learning to compute the remaining useful life of this system also. So what if there's a defect? Can this run for some more time? Today, we are integrating image-based analytics also to get a better understanding of the physics and making our interpretations even better. And I will talk to you about some very specific applications that we are looking at right now. So in essence, we want a self-decision-making system which can provide information about the health of a system, highly modular, which can be transferred across products and systems. And it will aid also in determining the remaining useful life. This is in summary, what we have tried to do. Of course, the data that comes out of this can always be used for new product development, optimization, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, what we have been looking for the last few years. Our approach has been the following. The conventional uh, product development involves 
concept design, detailed design, then you actually develop a prototype, test, validate, and then you consume the product. Um, and once you start using the product, we got into fault detections, fault diagnosis, prognosis, et cetera. Now the question being asked is, can we integrate these two and come up with a decision support system or a decision making system, which a system that can aid in decision making, which helps me take care of many things. First, it can give me feedback to improve the technologies. It can also help me in managing operating demands. That means downtime of machines, et cetera. Since I know I had tough time what the problem would be. So this is more of a predictive maintenance type activity, you know, uh, which helps an ordinary user know ahead of time what to expect and then take decisions based on what could happen. So it also helps in terms of mission planning, et cetera. So where we started a few years back was using fuzzy logics, you know, neural network technologies. All these were either experimental or data-driven models. Today, we are going and looking into failure physics, model-based prognostics, which means we are looking at physical models and the reliability of this in actual operation. So th this is really where, uh, you know, the, the <clears throat> engineering world is getting into looking at the AI and ML integration into uh, engineering. So the whole thing starts with data acquisition, data manipulation, then state detection, which is basically to identify the health of the system, do the health assessment, which means do the diagnosis part, and then provide some prognostics information and essentially generates some advisory. Now, as we started this, we started realizing that uh, we could not directly use the AI and ML uh, knowledge that's already available in the IT industry to engineering. Uh, we have a group which is a combination of computer scientists, mechanical engineers, electrical, electronics people, everybody. Okay. So when I talk to my computer science person, Dr. Anthony, who is also an expert in AI and ML, initially he said, hey, I need millions of sets of data points. Then we brought him to the lab and told him, listen, this is the number of sensors that I have. Maybe I can put five sensors, maximum six, get data, let's say in three directions from each sensors, et cetera. All that I can get is probably 10, 20 points from each system. Um, then uh, he said, uh, what do I do with 10, 20 points? That is when uh, we started looking into technology called sparse data analytics. How do I take minimum set of data points and we still be able to reliably predict what is happening with the system. So then we created a fleet of uh, machines so that I get at least 30, 40 points. Uh, from a statistical perspective, 30 points was still a reliable number of data to, to get into some decision making uh, in a mode. And then we, I told him my decisions should be based on the physics, which means I have to look at the response and I know an experienced engineer can look at the response and say what's happening. That intelligence, we wanted to bring it into the system and I will show you what it means. And therefore we also wanted uh, uh, devices to make decisions based on the actual physical response. This is where our digital twin approach, uh, uh, you know, is differentiated from many who claim to do a lot of digital twin, you know, uh, activity. A lot of them, they take the data, plot the data, fit a good curve and uh, for them that itself is good enough analytics we said that is only a part of the whole thing in fact we have developed actual hardware okay which takes in institute data compares that data with the numerical data and takes decisions based on the physical responses and the diagnosis part is done using ai and the prognosis part is done using ml uh, and then the, we have now mounted these devices on actual systems to get real data and uh, you know make my machine learning even more agile, adoptable, et cetera. So other issue that we saw was that in real engineering problems, defects happen inside the system and all my data is coming from outside the system. So how do I take the data from outside and be able to reliably predict what is happening inside? A motor, for example, 
you know most of the time the bearing fails <clears throat> the bearing is inside the motor but my data is coming from outside the motor can i be able to predict and say okay looking at the physical response that this particular response corresponds to a bearing failure this is exactly where a lot of uh, uh, domain knowledge uh, experience and the intelligence based on that have to be integrated into the ai and ml algorithms and uh, that is where engineering digital pins become more complex because you need people with the domain knowledge with the experience who can look at the data and who can uh, say that okay if this is how the data looks then this is what the problem is and that needs to be you know uh, somehow put into the digital twin and the digital twin has to understand that yes if this is the response then it should come back and say okay this is probably uh, the defect with a certain level of probability so this involves probability reliability statistics of course engineering and numerical simulation okay and some new approaches that we are trying now are based on other things because i am looking at data inside the system because that is something that i need to know because my failures happen inside especially if there is temperature involved you know and i'll show you one application that we are getting into right now where the temperatures are fairly high and how do i get the data and then we also are developing something called face field models how do i link the face field models with the in situ data etc to take better decisions so image based analytics play an important role there so that is something that uh, we are already looking into and more importantly when you put this actual device on the field start getting data a lot of things that you may have missed in a regular lab setup which is an ideal setup and there be some uncertainty or many uncertainties on the field and my machine learning uh, should have the capability to uh, first of all identify that there was a problem which it did not know before and then the severity of the problem and then of course has to take decision based on that okay and this we started with uncertainty you know qualification and now we have got into uncertainty quantification which is another big uh, domain uh, basically in the digital twin technology for engineering and uncertainty quantification is also a key requirement uh, uh, when you put these devices especially on automobile for example so this case study i showed last time where we started with a simple motor and then we developed a basic digital twin wired a digital twin for this motor then we went to the fleet of motors to increase the amount of data and when we say physics based analytics we look at this response for example if the first response is picking up actually there is no problem with the system there's different the, we first of all we have to identify what are the possible defects in a given system for example a motor coupled to a pump in this case there's defects that are possible are called misalignments angular misalignment parallel misalignment bearing me you know defects etc all that will be manifested in the response so our digital twin which was originally a wired digital twin is now a complete wireless digital twin which is very very small in aspect ratio takes the data mainly in terms of acceleration current temperature etc and makes decisions on the depending upon the response and all these gui have been completely written by us at various levels of complexity at the front end the operator gets a dial which shows acceleration levels temperature levels remaining useful life etc one level down one can see the responses and see why it came up with that decision and going to the third step it also tells me what is the remaining useful life <coughs> as the system starts functioning so this was the first ever digital twin that was developed for siemens and probably the only physical digital twin that was ever built and then the, so we come have we 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 this complete setup was completely designed uh, fabricated built by us and we did a lot of studies in terms of vibration thermal and current and we correlated the simulations with test we created all these gui's because your data comes in time domain it has to be field noise and then the frequency response f50 has to be done and then you have information about uh, the temperature the current etc and then decisions have to be made based on these responses 
And now today it's completely wireless integrated to cloud and it can do both diagnosis and prognosis. This is the level that we achieved with this particular digital twin. Now, a couple of other people got interested and the CMTI has a program called SMART. Uh, you know, and, and then they wanted us to see if we can take the digital twin dollop for a rotor dynamic application or a rotating system application to the spindle of a machine because spindle of a machine is like the heart of the system of any machine. And uh, at any manufacturer who is into machining would always love to know if the spindle is going to fail, when it is going to fail, uh, and if it fails, then what's the effect, for example, on the machining processes itself. So this is an activity that we started along with CMS and CMTI, where we have now developed a small diagnosis module for the motor. Uh, now it is connected by edge devices to their inventory management. Why inventory management is required is, for example, if I have to replace the spindle, it has, so my digital pin tells me that there's a problem, it can run for 10 more hours, and then what? So I need to know whether I can replace it or if I have to repair it, whether somebody for repairing is available, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have developed a, a link to the inventory management, and now we are working on the availability module also. So ahead of time, I can tell you that if this is the spindle of your choice for this particular CNC machine, then this machine is available to you for this many number of hours before a possible first failure can happen. And they need it because then they can plan their you know, production activities accordingly, and they can be assured that it will run for those many number of hours. So this is one activity that we have got into. This is another very interesting activity we are doing for Mercedes themselves. This is on the churning loss uh, simulation as I mean, ultimately it gets into digital pin for transmission. Fundamentally, what is happening is I do have another presentation if I can open just to give you a glimpse of what this is. <coughs> so a typical transmission has a gear and a pinion. And uh, this gear is made to rotate at different speeds dep depending upon your gear ratios. Now, different speeds, you have different physics happening here in terms of uh, fluid flow that happens at the interface. Now, depending upon the gap between the tip of the gear tooth and the uh, gearbox itself, the, there's something called as a churning loss because of the churning of the oil in between them. And the churning uh, loss determines the amount of torque that is lost during the motion of the vehicle. So they want to fundamentally understand what should be the optimum gap between the gear teeth and the gear box, what is the minimum oil level, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a CFD simulation. And we have now developed a test bench for them, a basic test bench. Uh, you can come to our lab, we can show it to you live. And for all that, we have developed the GUI Etc. to measure the torque, temperatures, RPM, because they're all the dependent variables. And we run this at the different speeds. So low speed, the whole physics is different. High speed, the total physics is different. So we need to capture the physics, both from the experimental activity, from the numerical simulation, combine that to actually develop the digital pin for the transmission. So this is one active activity which is already ongoing. This entire test trig is ready. We have collected a lot of data. We are analyzing the data. And ultimately, we will develop a digital pin for the transmission, which then goes onto the actual vehicle. Data on the vehicle is collected. And the machine learning is updated to, to, to become more agile and useful. A combination of that is also distribution of the oil inside the transmission itself. Uh, if you actually open up the transmission, you will see that it has many holes, which are big, small, etc., into which actual, you know, transmission oil is getting into. Although all these things have been developed for more than 100 years, they still want to know whether optimum amount of oil is actually getting into each of these orifices. That means they want to understand the mass flow rate, they want to understand the pressure, etc. So we have developed one of the most unique test benches, probably the only one on the globe, where we have transparent shafts uh, and we have 
orifices of different sizes connected back to a tank and this operates in closed loop continuously. Uh, data measured in terms of flow rates, pressures, temperatures, etc. And we want to link that with basically an optimum value of pressure and flow rate inside these orifices so that uh, we can have an optimum distribution of this uh, uh, transmission fluid inside the system. This is something that Mercedes definitely wants to do as a part of the e-vehicle activity. Uh, even an electric vehicle has basically a motor which drives a gearbox and uh, they want to know what is the optimum distribution of the oil inside the gearbox. So this is another test facility that we have put together. Now, a couple of other things that we are working on is the digital paint for a small tool holder for CMTI and a slightly complicated activity on smart heat treatment and automated well. This is what the industry needs. And then for the medical system domain, we are working on the digital paint for an autoclave. And for Total, which is a lubricant company, we will start working on a digital pin for the lubrication system and the e-motors again for Mercedes. So for example, this is an activity we have started with uh, basically CMTI for developing a digital pin for a cutting tool holder. Essentially what they want is the following. Suppose you take a cut in a CNC machine today, which has multiple of cutting tools. At this point in time, they go by the record book and say, okay, after so many number of hours of operation, this tool has to be replaced. They don't know whether the tool is in a condition where it can be used for some more time or it, should it be really replaced. So people across the globe are looking at uh, smart tool holders where data is continuously collected on different characteristics of this tool, such as vibration, temperature, and all related to the surface finish. So that at any point in time, I know that I'm getting the desired surface finish in this case, because it's a milling operation, okay, of the specimen. And I look at the responses, which are basically okay, the, 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 the vibration, temperature, et cetera. And depending upon the response, I will be able to identify ahead of time whether the tool is really getting worn out or if the tool is, my tool is worn out, can it run for some more time, et cetera, similar to what we did on that motor, okay? And all that they want to do it on an existing tool holder itself so that uh, an existing tool can become a smart tool. Uh, so this is a, a work that has just started and uh, we are in the process of developing a smart tool holder and it has huge implications in the manufacturing industry. So we are looking at similar responses in terms of forces, torques, moment, you know, temperature and vibration, and then they take decisions on, on uh, how good that tool is, okay? And this is all happening in real time. So we have identified a cutting tool, we have a building up this test bench, and we are actually starting to do with these experiments and ultimately develop a digital twin for the tool holder. Same question was asked, and uh, they said that uh, welding, especially if you take, uh, take uh, the welding of uh, uh, hull, for example, of a 65 meter ship, you can imagine how many thousands of welds that are there. And today, the, one of the big problems that they have is to identify the quality of the weld. They do it after the welding is done. Some cases it is semi-automatic, et cetera, but it consumes a lot of time and many money to, to actually do the quality check of tens of thousands of welds. So the question that was asked was, can we develop an automated welding system which can be mounted on the existing welding system or welding devices and in situ be able to say whether the weld that got formed was a good weld or a bad weld. So here a lot of material science is involved. Plasma physics is involved in case of some welding activities. And of course, trying to understand the responses and then taking a decision on a good weld or a bad weld. So this is uh, one of the research activities which is gaining 
lot of uh, momentum these days across the globe. People are looking into this physics. And uh, this is another project that uh, we have just started with the CMPI on developing a digital twin assisted automated welder device. And a little bit more complicated device is the smart heat treatment system. So irrespective of automotive or aerospace or general engineering companies, most products that get created, and especially when they're made up of metals, they do undergo heat treatment. Currently, they go through a heat treatment furnace, the product comes out, then they do a non-destructive type testing and try to identify if they got a good heat treated product, especially large gear manufacturers and all that. Now, the question that was posed was, can we develop a digital twin, which looks into what is happening inside the furnace real time, and along with numerical simulations, be able to say that the grain structure that got formed during the heat treatment process is conforming to an acceptable microstructure of the material as desired. So here we are also linking with IIC Bangalore and uh, we are working with the material science group. And uh, on one side, we are actually developing the face field models to understand the microstructure of a material at different temperatures under heat treatment process. Then we have some sophisticated cameras that is going to get into the heat treatment furnace, which can also give me in situ the microstructure of whatever the material that's getting formed. And here we are going to use image-based analytics to compare the microstructure of the in situ you know, material along with the face field uh, diagrams, and then come to some conclusion about the quality of the heat treatment. And then of course, manage the temperature, currents, et cetera, to get a better quality heat treated material. And uh, you know, a uh, lot of the Indian defense manufacturing industries really are interested to look into these sort of activities. And across the globe, every major country in the world, they're investing quite a bit of research on digital twin for smart furnaces. So this is one additional activity that uh, we have just started. I thought I'll just share with you uh, some of the additional work on the manufacturing side. So it's an integration again of computer scientists, material scientists, mechanical engineers, electrical electronics guys, ultimately to develop a hardware which instantly can provide information about the quality of the heat treatment that has happened. And then I just wanted to touch base on the DT for health. I recently met one of the Siemens uh, R&D people from actually Singapore. Okay, then she was talking to me and she said, "Why can't we look at the digital twin for the healthcare system?" And she sent me this slide. So she is looking at various applications from healthcare monitoring to medicinal control to emergency warning systems to treatment planning, drug development, and medical device design. So I have just started looking at some of these. Probably given our background, we can start with a medical device design development and then get into some of the other things. This I thought may be of interest to you also. Uh, although it may not fall directly under SIG, but some of these things, triple IT B also could be interested and I can connect the right people, you know, uh, with respect to this technology. So I think this is something that uh, I wanted to show you. And these are all in our lab. You can come and have a look at it. Uh, we have completely set this up and uh, we can give you a live demo, demo of. I think Roland, this is what I had for today. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Suresh. So I think you gave a wonderful overview of how actually digital twin technology is being applied. And I remember the times in the 90s when we talked about diagnostic systems. Always a question was what went wrong in the system and could you defer anything or infer anything from the data? 
And this digital twin technology has now taken it forward to integrate all those models uh, plus the structural information we have around the systems. And that was really a fantastic overview in so many different domains. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to open up the dice for uh, any questions that have come up. And while maybe, um, you know, you could type the questions into the chat box, uh, any of the, uh, you know, participants could also, uh, you know, just switch on uh, their mic, uh, ask a question in person, that would be actually very nice. And um, if there is no question at the moment already, I would like to ask my first question, because I jotted down a few now uh, while um, I was listening to the talk. May I ask a question? Uh, of course. Welcome. Yeah. Please. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm Varsha. Uh, so I, I have this uh, doubt that in a digital twin, uh, we are making uh, the twins of the uh, physical system, right? So it can be embedded software, uh, which is coming in healthcare, education, or whatever, like uh, medicine, uh, even industrial controllers, all those uh, systems will come in picture, right? So uh, while testing, <clears throat> while testing such system, we we use uh, software uh, like a uh, first step will be we'll test the software then the simulation and then uh, on target testing will be there right so if we are making digital twin the main advantage is that uh, testing can be <coughs> done uh, on on this digital twin instead of uh, testing it in the real world am i correct yeah see essentially what uh, so let's say there's a digital pin for this motor huh so this digital pin already has the sensors inside it like a vibration sensor or an accelerometer basically or a temperature sensor these are all nano sensors basically or a current sensor etc so i don't need any other physical sensor on the system because the digital pin has already I mean, it is, uh, it has these embedded sensors inside it, okay? And what it will do is it will start collecting the data from the system in terms of different physical quantities, like it could be an acceleration measurement, it could be a temperature measurement, it could be a current measurement, et cetera. And then I have the GUI, which also continuously displays for me these things. But at that point in time, I will not be able to say whether the system is having a problem or not having a problem. The diagnosis has not yet been done. Now, if I want to do the diagnosis, I always have to compare the response with a certain other response, okay, which could be a defective or a non-defective response. So when I compare this response with another set of responses, which typically comes from numerical simulations, some can come from experimental data, et cetera, I will be able to say that with this level of probability, this particular signature corresponds to this signature, which I already have in the database, and be able to say with a high degree of probability that this signature corresponds to a non-defective system or a defective system, and if it's a defective system, to this particular defect. So essentially, I need to take the data out and be able to at least do a preliminary diagnosis of the health of the system. And once I have it, then what if there is a problem? Can this run for some more time? It's a standard question everybody asks. So I will yeah. be able to then determine the minimum life of that system. Yeah, so there comes the question of mine. Like if right. uh, like if there is a heat due to uh, friction of something, so it <clears> could <throat> vary, right? At, uh, it, on target testing only, uh, we will be able to figure out such kind of problems, right? So can we do uh, like, uh, so the sensor with uh, no friction and sensor with, with friction will be given different data, right? So That's if right. Uh, so my digital pin will have to have the right sensor for the right application. Okay. Okay. okay for so, example, I will, I will give you one example. Right now, I mean, exactly something similar Total wants us to do. Hmm. So they have developed the lubricant, okay, hmm. which Mm -hmm. goes in between not rotating systems but reciprocating systems okay 
Okay. Okay. Now what is happening is, for whatever reason, the lubricant that they have developed is leaving some black mark between the two reciprocating seams. So they don't know whether that has happened due to the friction between the two or because of the lubricant itself. And they have requested us to actually measure the horizontal frictional force, which is not very easy to do. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Now, there is only one company in Japan, which is still developing a sensor which can measure the horizontal frictional force. Okay. So if in a digital twin, if I'm not getting data from such a sensor, then you're hmm. absolutely right that I'm talking of some other physics which is not even existing. Okay. Uh -huh. So to that extent, the digital being will be able to say, I don't understand whatever data I'm getting. So then you need an interpreter, which is an experienced person who sees the data and says, yes, it is right. That it is not looking at the right data. It is looking at some other data and therefore it is unable to make a decision. So mm -hmm. this is where the complexity, you're absolutely right, comes in engineering. You need mm -hmm. the domain knowledge. You need people to be able to you know, identify and say that, okay, this problem probably is because of this. And hmm. that is the reason why you need a team which is multidisciplinary with a lot of experience and be able to interpret the data first. Because hmm. all that knowledge is going to go into your AI and ML and make the system more intelligent. And uh, this is absolutely right. I mean, this is exactly where all the problem comes. And, uh, you know, in the initial development stage, once all this gets ironed out, then only the digital can will be useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Kartika. Yes, I am Kartika here. Uh, so the uh, question is uh, uh, in continuation with your previous answer. So uh, now we cannot use a digital twin in a development or a design phase, whereas only after production, if production has certain issues which you, we cannot test in production, uh, we'll uh, use the data that we gather in production to use it on digital twin and uh, do a fault isolation. Uh, is that right? No, not necessarily. I can always create, okay, mm. uh, a test rig which mimics the reality, okay? Mm. This is where those test rigs are coming into picture, okay? Mm. And, and, and at that stage, I can create as many defects as I want to. But what happens is for each defect, I cannot create another test rig because it will be very expensive. That is where the simulation comes into picture because in simulation, I can create as many number of defects as I want to. And, and actually I can create a database of all responses for different scenarios. This is where the simulation part comes into picture. In fact, in today's world, okay, even before, for example, the first car is built, we have moved away from physical prototypes to virtual prototypes. First mm. of all, on the tube, my, uh, you know, that car has to work in terms of its functional requirements, in terms of durability, NVH, safety, et cetera. If it does not, then we won't even cut the sheet metal. So to that extent, uh, the simulations are very, very powerful. And I can actually create a virtual, you know, let's say manufacturing say, system. And I can make all changes in all variables and try to understand the sensitivity, sensitivity of the change. So which means I can do design sensitivity analysis, I can do optimization, I can do everything much more, I mean, ahead of time during the concept stage itself. So those things are possible at the concept stage right now. That is the reason where in a digital twin we combine whatever is possible from a test trick along with new simulation the test trick is required for me because at least one set of data from the test and the simulation has to be uh, verified or validated. Then I have a robust uh, you know, virtual model in which I can create as many defects or failures as I want to. Those are all your test cases. And then I can do the simulation and I have a database of all possible scenarios of that system. So at the concept stage, definitely it can be done. We don't have to wait till the production. Okay, so uh, in that case, we do have this modeling languages like state flow and all, which does, as you said, the automated uh, simulation. So how is it different from digital twin? No, so a digital it... See, when we talk of digital twin today, eight out of 10 people will tell you that I'll collect some data, I will fit a good curve, and I will just say Y equal to some F of X. 
that has been done for a long time. In fact, all of us are of Six Sigma black belts from GE. So mm -hmm. enough of transfer functions we have developed. The question now is, is the transfer function just good enough or capable enough to tell me A, if there is a problem with the system, mm -hmm. real time, and mm -hmm. then if there is a problem, can it also tell me if the system can run for some more time? I will give you a very simple example, which I use in most talks, okay? Easy to understand. Let us say you want to know the health of your heart. It's a classic example. In fact, I have the passion to develop one, but I'm not finding the time. So now you go and you get an ECG done. Mm. Now, what is an ECG? So you'll get a graph of your heart, mm. okay? And a good uh, cardiologist will say, your graph is fine, not fine. Mm. Okay, and you make some decisions based on that. Now, imagine if one of those probes that is put on the body is a digital twin of your heart. What it can do, it can not only give you the you know, pulse, basically, which is the physical response of your heart. Imagine that it is connected to some 1 million data points, which is easily available in the medical domain, mm. wherein I can instantaneously compare the response I'm getting from one of those probes along with the million set of data points. And I will be able to pinpoint and say, okay, if there's a problem, this particular response corresponded to this particular problem of this patient. And if that patient also, his, if his history is known, I will also know that this problem happened because of ABCD reasons. And then this was the prognosis that was provided. And based on that, he also lived for this many years. So mm -hmm. your one of the heart probes can become a digital twin of your heart. Okay. okay. Yes. That's a very simple example. And again, the problem is the problem is the heart is inside the body. You're getting the data from outside. How do I mm. take the data from outside, marry with inside? These are the complexities in engineering that we talk about. That is where when we start developing this digital pin for engineering, all these mm. additional complexities come into picture and it becomes a team effort where you have an expert from one domain telling the other person exactly this is what I'm looking for, etc. Because like for a computer scientist, it just looks at the extra data, plots it, and then he is basically done with that. But mm. for an engineer, it does not help because I want to know whether there is a problem because of this. And if there is a problem, then what do I do? Right. So the digital twin, therefore, is a much more holistic thing than just you know looking at simple analytics. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question um, regarding what are the innovation drivers for digital twins, which we can see. You have ex described uh, the concept, the model, the application areas. What do you see as a main field for innovations in the future in digital twins? Is it on the sensor side? Is it on the model side? Is it on the machine learning side? Is it on the holistic integration side? What, what do you think are the innovation drivers? No, at every stage, there is some innovation, Roland. Uh, you know, and I think uh, the, the, the difficulty will be on the uncertainty quantification. Sensors mm -hmm. are fairly reliable. So, I'm getting good, useful data on, on the sensor side. But uh, mm -hmm. coming from the engineering perspective, for example, I'll give you some examples where we had uh, some, I would say, issues. So initially, we started using MATLAB for this whole thing because MATLAB has all the libraries. But mm -hmm. we suddenly realized that the F15 MATLAB is not all that great. Okay, mm -hmm. Because it expects a good time history data to get a good frequency response data. But in engineering, mm -hmm. you always have noise. Now, eliminating noise itself is a very interesting and challenging problem in engineering. The automotive people mm -hmm. for NVH have been developing this for the last 30, 40 years. That LMS is one of the most sophisticated software for you know, converting time to frequency domain by noise and also eliminating all the noise in between. And the amount of filters that they have developed is just simply amazing. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of innovation right there for the automotive industry and then uh, how to read, you know, get rid of the noise and get the useful time data. And that too, you have to get that in almost nanoseconds because you don't have much time because you're doing everything real time. Mm -hmm. so that was one of the challenges that we had. In fact, all the coding we are done in R right now because my R has better libraries, you know, mm -hmm. 
be harnessed yeah. for this uh, time to frequency conversion compared to even MATLAB or Python. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, that was another innovation for us because we just simply went from something to something else. And now mm -hmm. the speed, the speed at which I have to gather the data, infer the data, make a decision, and you know take some uh, action against it. And everything mm. needs to be connected to the cloud and uh, the speed at which, because you are collecting data at uh, almost what every millisecond, for example. And imagine the amount of data that has to be stored, interpreted, managed in uh, just no time. So there's yeah. a huge question that is there in terms of how to manage this sort of data real time, which is coming, uh, which has to be understood. Uh, uh, you know, a decision has to be made because it is a decision making system and I don't want to lose time. And then the edge devices to connect it to other PLM environments, you know, like the inventory management system, uh, new product development, uh, database, et cetera, et cetera. That mm -hmm. itself is another activity. And the wireless sensors, which are today available in uh, nano size and IND, you know, semiconductor issues these days. And it is another. So innovation is there at every single stage of uh, uh, the development. At the, mm -hmm. at the macro level, it may seem like we are taking some data, comparing that with something and taking some decisions. But even mm -hmm. generating the data itself is a, a thing by itself. And uh, see, now what we are seeing on that uh, you know, churning loss uh, test rig is that by the time the torque sensor senses the data and passes it on to the digital twin, there is a lag. Mm -hmm. Because of the mm -hmm. lag, we are losing uh, time data in between. That means mm -hmm. I need a device which has a much higher baud rate than what I'm using right now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that means it's more, it's going to be more expensive. And now, of course, people are looking at devices uh, which has very high baud rates, which are much less uh, expensive, things like that. It, ultimately, in the automotive industry, you know that everything boils down to cost. So yeah. uh, there, there is uh, still a lot of uh, uh, scope at every stage of uh, this whole digital twin development. Mm -hmm. Great, and thank my you. My data has to be as good as it should be, otherwise my decisions will not be good enough. Yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true. Yeah, DT for engineering is a very involved and a very interesting activity. Yes, it certainly is. Um, one final question from my side, um, the remaining useful life, how accurate are the models uh, when you use a digital twin to predict the remaining useful life of a device? So here we tried over a dozen algorithms and ultimately mm -hmm. we went to the health industry where Germans have developed a model to sort of predict the life and death of an individual coming to a hospital, for example, for a particular type of disease. So mm -hmm. we said, uh, Missions are also like that. They also have finite life once, you know, there's some failure in the system. And so yeah. we applied the Kepler-Muller model to this one. And actually we mm -hmm. ran in that case, the Siemens uh, entire test setup for one and a half years, continuously 24 seven nonstop to get the failure for, uh, or defects. And then we actually applied this model onto that data. And uh, mm -hmm. so far, whatever, uh, the, you know, life estimate that we are getting, is fairly good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Are there any more questions? Well, I see that is uh, not the case. Then I would like to, again, thank you so much for that really insightful talk. I think we all learned a lot and uh, it's really a great pressure to a pleasure to have you here on the dice, uh, Professor Sorish. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I think that is okay, the thank topic. Thank you very much. That, uh, so we are moving away from the realm of simulations. We started yes, with simulation, so well. and we are going beyond the boundaries of simulation. Let me put it that way. So to me, digital twin is all about going beyond that boundary. That's, I think, a very nice closing word also, right? going beyond the boundary. So thanks you again, and Thank you. thanks Thank you for very... participating. Thanks for the question. I wish everybody a wonderful day and uh, hope to see you soon again. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye then.
Thank You're you. Welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor Suresh. Thank you, Professor. Thank you Roland, so much. Yeah. For sharing the session. And it was a very enlightening uh, session. Thank you.